Hello class, this is Professor Gabor. We're going to cover a chapter here, chapter 8 on confidence intervals. There's three sections, single population mean using the normal distribution, a single population mean using the student t distribution, and a population proportion. So, We use sample data to make generalizations about a population. We've already talked about that. The population is a mean and standard deviation, and those are called parameters. We estimate those using sample statistics for the mean, the average, and the standard deviation, which we've already covered. So uh, the sample data helps us make an estimate of the population parameter we can make an inference about what the population parameter is. Now, one thing that you have to notice is that if we keep taking the, a mean of a sample of, of 10, say, and a population of a million, every time we take a sample of 10, we're going to get a different mean, and we take it over and over and over again. And that, that sample mean has its own distribution, and we're going to talk about that. We already talked about that with the central limit theorem. So suppose you're trying to determine the mean of a rent of a two-bedroom apartment in your town. You might look in the classified and write down several rents listed and then average them together. And that would be what we call a point estimate of the true mean. We realize the point estimate is most likely not the exact value of the population parameter, but it's close to it. What we want to know is how close it is. So after calculating point estimates, we construct interval estimates called confidence intervals. You know, sometimes you might say, okay, how much are we going to sell next month? Uh, and no one knows what you're going to sell next month, but you make some educated guess to say we're going to sell a uh, million dollars worth of, uh, our sales will be a million dollars. But you know it's not going to be necessarily exactly a million. It might be a million two, it might be 800, it might be something else and we don't know exactly what it is you might be better off giving an interval estimate saying we're going to sell between 900,000 and 1.1 million the point estimate is a million but we're you know plus or minus uh, a hundred thousand dollars so that's the idea of the confidence interval so we've already talked about point estimates and a point estimate is uh, we will learn how to construct and interpret confidence intervals. And we're going to learn about a new distribution called the student t. And if, you know, we use the normal distribution if we know the population standard deviation. But if we have to use the sample standard deviation, um, <clears throat> we have to use this other distribution called the student t. And um, so if you worked in a marketing department of an entertainment company, you might be interested, like, example, in the mean number of songs uh, consumers downloaded a month from iTunes. Uh, people don't do that anymore. They stream mostly, but this is an old thing. It doesn't really matter on the example. So if you could conduct a survey and calculate the sample mean and the sample standard deviation, you could use the sample mean, which we refer to as X bar, X with a line over it, a bar over it, to estimate the population mean, and S to estimate the population standard deviation. The sample mean X bar is called a point estimate. It's the one number, if you're going to hang your hat on one number, that would be the number you would hang your hat on. The sample standard deviation is then used to get that plus or minus. So each of X bar and S is called a statistic, and as we've said already many times, X bar is a statistic that estimates a point estimate of the population parameter mu, the population mean, and S is the sample statistic of standard deviation and is used to estimate the population parameter sigma, or standard deviation of population. So, the confidence interval example. Suppose by iTunes, we do not know the population mean, but we do know the population standard deviation is equal to 1, and our sample size is 100. Well, then by the central limit theorem, the standard deviation for the sample mean is sigma divided by square root of n, or 1 divided by the square root of 100 
the square root of 100 is 10, so 1 tenth or 0.1. And we're going to use the empirical rule here to say if we want to find out 95% probability or 90% probability of where the mean really is, we can do that estimate. So if we want to find two standard deviations from the mean, uh, the sample mean is likely to be within 2.2 two, 2 units of the mean. And that's a 95% probability of that. So that's called a 95% confidence interval. Let's look at an example. Because x bar is within 2.2 2 units of mu, which is unknown, then mu is likely to be within 0.2 units of x bar and a 95% of the samples. This is a key sentence. Because x bar is within 0.2 units of mu, which is unknown, then mu is likely to be within 0.2 units of x bar in a 95% of the samples. That is a 95% confidence interval. So if we take our point estimate plus or minus 0.2, that would be our 95% confidence interval. So, the, is be, so if we look at the next statement, in other words, mu is between x bar minus 0.2 and x bar plus 0.2 in 95% of the samples. For the iTunes examples, suppose that the sample produced a sample mean of 2. Then the unknown population mu is between is between what? They didn't actually write it, so let's write it. It's between, if I want to subtract 0.2, it's going to be between two minus 0.2, which is point, uh, 1.8, and 2.2. So we say the 95% confidence interval Confident that the unknown population mean number of songs downloaded from iTunes per month is between 1.8 and 2.2. The 95% confidence interval is this. And you use parentheses because you don't actually uh, include or don't include 1.8 and 2.2. It doesn't matter because the, the actual points have zero probability, as we know, in the normal distribution. Interpretation of this. 95% confidence interval implies two possibilities. Either the interval 1.8 to 2.2 contains the true mean, or the sample produced an X bar that is not within 0.2 units of the true mean. The second possibility happens only 5% of the time. So 5% of the samples so that's why we get this confidence. We have a confidence. We're, we're making a judgment. We only want to be wrong 5% of the time. So if we use that 5% confidence range, we know our point estimate, plus or minus 0.2, is within 95%. And it's, it's nothing more magical than that. Uh, we're not 95% sure. The interpretation is in 95% of the samples, uh, the true mean is going to be in that range. So confidence intervals for some parameters have the form point estimate minus margin of error, point estimate plus margin of error. The margin of error depends on a confidence level, what percentage of, of confidence, and the standard error of the mean. The standard error of the mean is that sigma divided by the square root of n. When you read newspapers and journals, some reports use the phrase margin of error. Other reports will, use, will not use the phrase, but include a confidence interval as a point estimate, plus or minus a margin of error. These are two ways of expressing the same concept. So calculating a confidence interval. So what the single population mean using the normal distribution? We have an unknown population mean where the population standard deviation for some reason is known. How can it be known? But it is. If you don't know the mean, how do you know the standard deviation? We need x as an estimate, x bar as an estimate from mu, and we need the margin of error. Here the margin of error, EBM, or they're calling it error bound for population mean, EBM. 
So let's, I'd rather call it margin of error all the time. The sample mean X is the point estimate of the unknown population mu. So it's really X bar. So we want to get X minus EBM margin of error and X plus margin of error. Since this depends on a confidence level, the confidence level is often considered the probability calculated confidence interval estimate will contain a two population parameter. What we're trying to do is find the multiplier from the standard normal distribution that covers that confidence percentage of the standard normal distribution and then use the central limit theorem and the empirical law to prove this. So the confidence level is called CL and it's usually a percentage in the high 90s, a 90 or above. You can make it for any number you want, but the standard, you know, you have a 90% confidence interval, um, 95%, 97, 8, 99.9, 99.99. So 1 minus that confidence level is called a significance level. So alpha is 1 minus that. So if you have a 90% confidence level, um, alpha, the significance, is minus 1 minus 0.9 or 10% or 0.1. So if I add alpha plus the confidence level, I get one. So we calculate the sample mean from the sample data. Remember, we already know how to do that. We know the standard deviation. We find the z-score that corresponds to the confidence level. We've already talked about that in class. And in fact, I've done some calculations for you. That's not the one. Here we go. In this chart right here. And um, you'll have the confidence level of 99.9 all the way down to 90. 90, 95, 98, 99. And we can do more. And if you see that the alpha is just 1 minus uh, that level. The... Um, the, the z value associated with that is the inverse norm of the standard normal distribution. So it's B3, which is the alpha value. So we get these numbers, 3.09. And if we take 1 minus the z value, we really want the positive answer. It's the same numbers. But if we're looking at the two-tailed thing, because we're using two-sided confidence intervals, you can do one-sided confidence intervals. You could use this, but we're doing two-sided. You have the alpha over 2. So you take the alpha over 2, and you find the 1 minus z um, alpha over 2. And we get these numbers. So mostly we'll be using these numbers here with these confidence levels. And these will, we'll use these as a multiplier. How many standard deviations on the uh, on this? How many standard deviations away from x bar, the plus or minus factor we want to use? So we're going to take if we're doing a ninety percent confidence interval, it'll be one point six five plus or minus one point six five standard deviations away from the mean. So let's go back to our chart here. So we calculate the error bound EBM, we construct the confidence interval, write a sentence that explains it. So where do we find the z values from? We've already explained it. Um, a z value of 95, a confidence level of 95, the alpha is 0 0.05, alpha over 2 is 0 0.025. So if we find that, it becomes uh, 1 minus that is 0.975, so we get 1.96. So we use the calculator or we use the uh, Excel th inverse norm to get that number. What did we get? If we had 95, the alpha is 0 0.025, you have plus or minus 1.96. I'll give you this table all the time. This is probably good for 80, 90% of the problems that you would do on this. 
so now if we look at this, we have the error bound formula or the uh, standard error. And again, I hate error bound. What were we calling it? Margin of error, EBM. So it's called margin of error is the z value from that table that we have times the standard deviation which we know from the population divided by the square root of n, n being the sample size. So we get that and we just take x bar which is our point estimate for the mean and subtract that margin of error and add that margin of error. So suppose the score on statistics exams. So we've, we've done this problem already in class. Are normally distributed with an unknown population mean and a population standard deviation of three points. In other words, they could write this as a number if they wanted, but they wrote it as a um, word. A sample of 36. Well, square root of 36 will be six, so that's convenient. And uh, the, the mean, the sample mean is 68. So find a 90% confidence interval. 90% confidence interval means I'm down here now, my alpha is 0.1, my alpha over 2 is 0.05, my plus or minus multiplier is plus or minus 1.645. So if I go to the next slide, the solution is, okay, we find the confidence, we've done all this, we found that we want a z.05, 1.645. So we, the, our margin of error, or that EBM they talk about, is 1.645 times 3 divided by the square root of 36. The square root of 36 is going to be 6. 3 over 6 is 1 half, so it's going to be 1 half of 1.645, which is 0.8225. So we know that our confidence interval is going to be x bar, which we know to be 68, plus or minus this 0.8225. So Minus that is 67.1775, plus that is 68.8225. So a 90% confidence interval on a score on this uh, exam, the point estimate is 68. That's what we have. But if I want to put a confidence around it of 90%, I get 67 and, you know, 1.8 to 68.82. So you can use a calculator to do it, the interpretation. We estimate with 90% confidence that the true population mean score for all statistics students is between these two numbers, 67.18 and 68.82. 90% of all confidence intervals constructed in this way contain the true mean of the sample score. So that's what we mean, 90% of all confidence intervals. If we do this over and over again, 90% of the time the mean will be in there. So that's what a 90% confidence interval really means. So here's some more data. If you want to find this, uh, the absorption rate of cell phone radiation into human beings, uh, we have these following numbers for different phones, and we could add them all up. And so we went and find a 98% confidence interval for this. And uh, we know that the sigma is 0.337. How do we know the sigma is 0.337? I'm not really sure. Um, but we know it, and we don't know the mean. So you could, you could do the same thing. How would I do it? I'd have to take the average of all these numbers. That's my point estimate. Then I have to have, um, what's the sample size? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 20, 30. My sample size is 30. So the standard deviation I'm going to use is this standard deviation divided by the square root of 30. And all I want to know is now the multiplier. Well, if I'm doing a 98% confidence interval, my alpha is 0.02, my alpha over 2 is 0.01. I'm going to multiply plus or minus 2.326. That's how you do it. How do we calculate the sample size? If we want a certain margin of error <clears throat> or a certain EBM, we have to calculate the sample size. Now, if we know what we want this to be, this margin of error, and we know what the confidence that we're talking about, we know the alpha 
and we can find the z, and we have our sigma, the unknown is n. If we solve this equation for n, n equals the z value squared, well, is z value times standard deviation divided by the margin of error, the whole thing squared. So in this formula, z is z alpha over 2. That's what we're talking about. They just, I think they use shorthand here for that. So let's look at an example. The population standard deviation for Foothill College is 15 years. Um, standard deviation of age. If we want to be 95% confident that a sample mean age is within two years of the true population mean age of Foothill College students, how many randomly selected Foothill College students must be surveyed? Well, we know our Z.025 is 1.96. How do we know that? Z.025, 1.96, right there. 95% confidence, alpha is 0.05, alpha over 2 is 0.025, I want my plus or minus to be plus or minus 1.960 or 1.96. So this is my 1.96. 15 is the standard deviation of population. I'm solving for n, and my, I want it to be within two years. So if I square all these numbers and do it, I have to have a population of 217. Always round that answer up to be able to do that. So if you want the margin of error in a political election, for example, you would solve an equation like this to find out how many um, people you have to, s to survey to be able at a certain confidence interval to get that margin of error. Okay, so now, all this time we've been saying we know what the population standard deviation is. The reality is we rarely know. I mean, if, if we know the population standard deviation, why wouldn't we know the population mean? Aha, uh -huh, yes, that's correct. But it's easier to calculate it assuming we know the standard deviation. When we assume we don't know the standard deviation, it gets a little testier. So there's this guy, William Gossett. He worked at Guinness Brewery in the late 1800s, you know, in the early 1900s, basically. He was born in 1876, so at the turn of the century, he was uh, uh, 24 years old. And he ran into this problem. His experiments with hops and barley produced very few samples. Just replacing sigma with S did not produce accurate results. So when he tried to calculate a confidence interval, he realized he could not use a normal distribution for the calculation. He found the actual distribution depends on the sample size. The bigger the end, the closer it is going to be to a normal distribution. So he discovered what is called the student T distribution. He wrote under the pen name student. That's where we get the name student. But his name was William S. Gossett, sometimes spelled with one S and sometimes spelled with two S's, believe it or not. I don't know why. Well, that's these slides. So, until the mid-70s, some statisticians used the normal distribution approximation for large sample sizes and only use a student t-distribution only when the sample uh, sizes of at most 30. When a sample was below 30, use student t. When the sample size was bigger, uh, we just used a, we assumed a normal distribution. That was, I remember, I learned it uh, that way. And even in the mid-70s and 80s, I was still going under that because we were using textbooks and we didn't have the computers. But now with graphing calculators and computers, we can calculate the normal distribution for anything and we can calculate the student T distribution whenever S is used as an estimate of sigma. So if you draw a simple random sample of size N from a population that has approximately a normal distribution, we say x bar minus mu divided by s divided by the square root of n has a t distribution, a student t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. The t score has the same interpretation as the z score. It measures how far from its mean value, x bar is from the mean value, for each sample size n, there is a different student's t distribution. That's where it gets complicated. 
So it's dependent on its degrees of freedom. So the bigger n gets, the closer this is going to get to the normal distribution. A graph of a student t distribution is similar to the normal distribution. And let's go uh, did I have uh, let's say student t distribution. So we go to Wikipedia, and we can look at this. It has, it's a bigger standard deviation than a normal distribution, if we look at this. And if we look at this picture, here's an example of it, when we look at it, and instead, they, this is the degrees of freedom. So 1, 2, 5, infinity. When it gets to infinity, I think it's a normal distribution. So you can see it has a wider spread. And with as the sample size increases, the spread becomes closer to a normal distribution. The cumulative distribution has the same kind of thing. The PDF is based on a gamma distribution, and it's um, we're not going to get into that because it requires more math than we know what to do with. But um, it's, let's just trust the system and let's trust the numbers that we get out of Excel for this. Okay. The mean of the student's t distribution is zero and the distribution is symmetric about zero. It has more probability in its tails than a standard normal because the spread of it has to be bigger to cover since we're not precise about the standard deviation we're going to have a larger margin of error to cover ourselves. So the graph of the student t distribution will be longer in the tails, thicker in the tails, I guess they're calling it. The exact shape of the student's t distribution depends on the degrees of freedom. As the degrees of freedom increases, the graph becomes more and more like the standard normal. As the sample size reaches infinity, it does become the standard normal distribution. The underlying population of individual observations is observed to be normally distributed with unknown population mean mu and unknown po sta population standard deviation sigma. The size of the underlying population is generally not relevant it, unless it is very small. As you could see in the picture that we had, even as small of a sample as five, it's getting close to the infinity, which is the standard normal distribution. So if you get above 30, it's, I think, the four or five decimal places pretty accurate. You can assume normality, which is why people had that rule of thumb. Okay, let's continue on. So let's say the notation for student's t distribution is the same as a random variable is um, t df, where df is degrees of freedom, and it's n minus 1, where n is a sample. So for sample, if we have a sample size of n equals 20 items, then we calculate the degrees of freedom as, follow this, n minus 1, 20 minus 1, or 19. So the we write the distribution as t19. Now, the margin of error is going to be t alpha over 2, not a z. It's the same thing, except it's a t distribution, not a z. S, not sigma, divided by the square root of n, where t sigma divided by 2 is the t square with the area to the right equal to alpha over 2. Then we use the degrees of, use the degrees of freedom and then the same standard deviation. So we're not going to use a calculator. We're going to use something else. So here's some, some, some data. The Human Toxome Project is working to understand the scope of industrial pollution in the human body. Industrial chemicals may enter the body through pollution or as ingredients in consumer products. In October 20, 2008, scientists at HCP tested core blood samples of 20 newborn infants. The core the cord blood or the core blood 
of an in utero newborn group was tested for 430 industrial compounds, pollutants, and other chemicals, including chemicals linked to brain and nervous system toxicity. Immune system toxicity and reproductive toxicity and fertility problems. There are health concerns about the effects of chemicals on the brain. This table shows how many targeted chemicals were found in each of the infant's cord blood. So they 20. So they should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we have 20. Use this sample data to construct a 90% confidence interval for the mean of the targeted industrial chemicals found in an infant's blood. Oh boy. Well, let's go to Excel. Let's create a new sheet here and make it bigger so we can see what we're doing and enter our data first. So what do we have? 79, 145, 79, 145, 147, 160, 116. Sometimes you have to transpose the data. In fact, I can make it easier on myself. I can put the data over here. I can make it smaller, first of all. And put it over here and just copy it. 145, 160, 116, 100, 159. 100, 151, 151, 15, 139 and 99. And how many do we have? We have 20 of them, which is what we wanted. So let's leave the raw data over here someplace. And why don't I add some rows? So there's my data right there. OK. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go to data. And I want to go to Analysis Tools. And I want to go to my Analysis. Oh, well, I've already added. Uh, I want to go to anal Data Analysis of where I want to go to. Sorry. And I want Descriptive Statistics. And I say OK. And I'm going to say, hmm. I want my input range. Where is my data? So I want to move this over here and I'm going to click in here and I'm going to say there's my data. It's in a column. There's no labels in the front row so it's I don't know what the data is. doesn't matter. And I want to put the data in the output range. I want to put my data uh, why don't I put it right here. That's where I want it to go. And I want summary statistics. And I want a confidence interval. And what do we want a confidence interval for? Uh, we want a 90% confidence interval. So let's see if it gives us a 90% confidence interval. Boom. This would make life really easy, wouldn't it? And we say OK. And it gives me all this. So here's my mean. 127.45. Here's my standard deviation, my sample standard deviation. Do I need all these decimal places? Let's say no. Let's take it down to just two decimal places. Let's take anything that's more than that down to two decimal places. And the confidence interval at a 90% confidence interval, did we say 90 or was it 95? Oh, they want a 90. So here it is. They're saying the multiplier is 10.04. Well, 
I'm not sure exactly how they do that, but let's calculate it ourselves. We have the mean. We have the standard deviation. And we have the sample size. Do we need any more? So what do we want to calculate? I don't know. We need the T degrees of freedom equals 19 and alpha alpha divided by 2 equals what? Well, alpha is, if it's 90, it's 10, so it's 5. 0 0.05. Um, S divided by square root of n. We can calculate that too. That's easy to calculate. That's equal to the standard deviation divided by SQRT of the sample size. So 5 point, let's take it down to two decimal places, 5.81. Now, we've never used the student t distribution before, and I can't tell you when the last time I had that. t dist, there we go, right there, t dist. And it gives you s, degrees of freedom, or x degrees of freedom, and the tails. So I'm not sure how this works. Let's click on this and see what it says. Describes a formula syntax usage of the t-distribution. Returns a percentage points probabilities for the student t-distribution where numeric value x is calculated value for t for the percentage points to be computed. T-distribution is used in hypothesis testing, blah, blah, blah. So for more information, this, we'll see the new functions, t.dist. Maybe we'll use that one instead. So that's, if I don't know what I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing. So let's try this. Let's go here and say t.dist. And I think we're talking about two tails is what we're talking about here. And we're trying to find uh, so let's see what this says returns a two-tailed student t-distribution. The student t-distribution is used to, in the hypothesis testing of small data sets. You use this function in place of a table of critical values. I don't want to use a table. Uh, X required, the numeric value at which to evaluate the distribution. Degrees of freedom is required, uh, an integer. If any argument is non-numeric, returns uh, an error. If degrees of freedom is less than one, you get an, an error. If x is less than zero, uh, it can't be negative. So an example. So we want, actually, we probably want the inverse, t distribution inverse, don't we? distribution what's the RT do well, it first gives you X and degrees of freedom which one do we want degrees of freedom cumulative We don't know what X is, do we?
Well, this is somewhat embarrassing, but that's okay. Um, could have done this ahead of time. I got my standard deviation. And let's say degree of freedom cumulative. dot to tail in terms of two tails to the same. Let's say an example. I wish to evaluate the distribution. 60 degrees of freedom. The formula equals that. I guess it was. We want the inverse though. Inverse distribution is what we might want. The T inverse function. Wow. That sounds pretty easy. Could have just done that at the first place. So let's go back here and say, start again, T inverse. Now you're thinking, okay, and it's, we want two tail, we want the probability and we want the degrees of freedom. So what's the probability here? We want, I don't know, let's look it up to see. Probability, required probability associated with the student's T distribution. Degrees of freedom we know is 19. So let's look at an example. Probability associated with the student's T distribution, 60 degrees of freedom. So they put in uh, Oh, they get at 54, they get this. So what do we want? We want degrees of freedom. Let's try this. Let's just see what we got. Let's put in 0 0.9. And 0.9, and we have 19 degrees of freedom. We get 1.27. So now if we multiply those two numbers together, margin of error, or what they call EBM in the textbook, what happens when we multiply those two things together? Oh, we're not going to get 10.04, that's for sure. So let's try something else. Let's try 0.1, 1.7. Mm, we might get it now. equals that times that. 10.03, and if I round that down, ten point oh four. So now if we have confidence interval, 90% confidence interval, confidence interval, lower limit, what is it going to be? It's going to be the mean minus that. If I want the upper limit, it's going to be equal to the mean plus that. There we go. Here's my confidence interval for this thing. Now, okay, it was embarrassing. I didn't know, but I could figure it out. You should be able to take my little example and try to reason out what we're trying to do. Probably I confused the living daylights out of you, but if I do another one now, I'm sure I can do it very well. And in fact, I know that the confidence interval from descriptive statistics, if I put in the right confidence interval, will give me the two-tailed EBM based on the data that I put in, which will save me a lot of time and trouble moving forward. So let's see what we get if we get the same answer. 117,412, 137,488, 117,41, 117,49. Really, if we take it to one more decimal place, 
four one one four eight nine. Yeah, I'm I'm calling it even at that point. We're accurate to two decimal places. So we're gonna have to do that. Now the next thing we can do is we want to do a population proportion. So during election year, we see articles in the newspaper that say confidence intervals in the terms of proportions. We talked about elections already, but it's really a proportion. For example, a poll for a particular candidate running for president might show a candidate has 40% of the vote within three percentage points if the sample is large enough. Often, election polls are calculated with 95% confidence, so the pollsters would be 95% confident that a true proportion of voters who favor the candidate would be 37 and 43. So it would be 0.4 minus 0.03 and 0.4 plus 0.03. The procedure to find the confidence interval of the sample size, the error bound, and the confidence level for the proportion is similar to that of the proportion means, but the formulas are different. So, how do you know you're dealing with a proportion problem? The underlying distribution is binomial. There's no mention of mean or average. They're just talking about proportion. If x is a binomial random sample, with x being binomial np, where n is the number of trials, and p is a probability, you thought we were done with the binomial distribution. We're not. But we're also going to use the normal approximation to the bi binomial here in just a second. To form the proportion of x, take the random sample for the number of successes and divide it by n. So if the number of trials, you know, the, the we call it p prime, is the estimate of the population proportion. We're not using a Greek letter. Sometimes a random variable is denoted p hat with the caret symbol on top. <clears throat> and that really comes from quality control. Uh, we use p hat all the time as the estimate for the population proportion. When n is large and p is not close to 0 or 1, we can use the normal distribution to approximate the binomial. And we say x has, and we use the, uh, what's the, the normal, the mean is going to be n times p and the standard deviation would be NPQ, so that the sample now, when we take, if we assume that's the, the normal approximation to the binomial, if we divide the random variable, the mean and the standard deviation by N, we get a normal distribution with for the proportions. So X divided by N is P hat or P prime, the estimate of the proportion, and this really won't make sense until we see an example. And the distribution will be NP divided by N, which is just going to be P, and NPQ divided by N, the square root of NPQ, which is a standard deviation of the binomial distribution, divided by N. So to simplify it algebraically, it becomes a square root of PQ divided by N. And uh, so we have the following. So we have to find this EBP now, they're calling it. And it's going to be Z alpha again. But it's going to be P prime, Q prime. Q is 1 minus P. So Q prime is 1 minus P prime divided by N. So this is the multiplier that we're going to use here. Is it the same slide? Boom, boom, same slide, twice, okay. Error bound formula and standard deviation. This formula is similar to the error bound formula, except that the appropriate standard deviation is different. For mean, when the population standard deviation is known, the appropriate standard deviation we use is PQ divided by N. However, in this error bound formula, we use P prime Q prime divided by N as a standard deviation instead of that. In the error bound formula, the samples P prime and Q prime are estimates of the unknown population proportions, P and Q. 
the estimated proportions are used because we don't, that's what we're trying to determine is the population P. The sample proportions are calculated from the data. P is the estimated proportion of success. Q is the estimated proportion of failures. Or P is the person that votes for your guy. And Q is the proportion that votes for the other guy. So what we have here is for the normal distribution of proportions, the z-score for the formula is going to be P prime minus P divided by PQ divided by N. That's what we're going to use. So, for a class project, a political science student at a large university wants to estimate the percent of students who are registered voters. He surveys 500 students and finds that 300 are registered voters. That means 200 are not. Compute a 90% confidence interval for the true proportion of for a confidence interval for the true percent of students who are registered voters and interpret the confidence interval. So the, let's, let's do it. They can use a calculator, I guess, is one way of doing it. But we're going to use something else. So let's think about this. We want a 90% 90 confidence interval. And what are we doing? So we're taking a, a z-score. So here we're assuming this this distribution. So if we go to, let's see, what was this? This was, uh, this is going to be example. And what example are we on here? 811. 8.11. And let's make it bigger so we can see what we're doing. Well, first of all, I've got to do that and make it bigger. We have P, I guess we're going to call it capital P prime, or a little p prime, equals, and what do we have? We have 300 out of 500. And if I don't put an equal sign, it won't calculate anything. Equal 3 divided by 5. It's going to be the same. So 0.6, this is my point estimate of registered voters. What is my N? I don't know. How many students did we look at? I think we looked at 500, wasn't it? Surveyed 500 students. Now we want, uh, okay, so if that's P, what is Q? Q prime is equal to what? Well, it's 1 minus P equals 1 minus that. So 0.6.4, and now I have my, where's my standard deviation of this thing? PQ divided by N square root. So we're going to call it S equals square root of point six times point four divided by five hundred. So we get point oh two one. Let's do it to four decimal places. 0.0219. Let's see how we're doing with the calculations that we did. 0 0.6, 0 0.4, and uh, where's the standard deviation? They didn't calculate the standard deviation. 0 0.6, 0 0.4 divided by 0.5. We already calculated, but they also want the Z. It was what? Confidence interval is 1, so it's going to be 0.10. Uh, so alpha over 2 is 0 0.05, and we already know that. 0 0.05, so it's 90, 05, 1, 6, 4, 5, is it? 1, 6, 4, 5. Yes, so Z is 
equals 1.645. Good for us. And now I have 90% confidence interval of P, my proportion. Let's do the upper limit or lower limit, I guess we do first. Lower limit, upper limit. So it's going to be equal to, oh, when we didn't calculate our our z times standard deviation, our margin of error. So let's move this here. Margin of error, I forgot what we call it, EBP, I guess they're calling it. EBP, but it's really margin of error, is going to be equal to that times that. So it's going to be 0 0.036. Let's take it to three decimal places. So what's my upper limit going to be? It's going to be P prime minus that. And it's going to be this is going to be equal to P prime, which is 0 0.06, plus that. So I get 0 0.564 to 636. 564 to 636. Good for us. So we've done that. Calculating the sample size. Using the same formula as before. Whoops. We have the z alpha over 2, p prime, q prime, divided by whatever the margin of error you want to be. So suppose a mobile phone company wants to determine the current percentage of customers age 50 or plus who use text messaging on their cell phone. How many customers age 50 plus should the company survey in order to be 95% confident of the sample? Well, let's go back to the formula. And this is example 814. Example 8.14. Okay. So, suppose a mobile phone company wants to determine the current percentage of its customers who use text messaging for their cell phone. How many customers age 50 plus should the company survey in order to do this? And they want the percentage to be within three percentage points of the two proper relations. So, so that's plus or minus 0.03. And the proportion of customers, okay, so we don't, this is the last slide. They don't actually don't provide an answer. But if we look at this, what do we not know here? We have this, we have this. Do we know the P times, P prime times Q prime? We don't know that. So unless we've already done some estimate of this, We're not going to be able to figure this out at this very moment. But we will figure out a way to figure it out. Because that's what we do. Concern percentage. How many customers should they have to do? That remains to be determined. I will post another video for that one. And so I want to call it quits here. And I'm sorry for the exploration nature of this, 
But even though I have a master's degree in statistics, I don't do it often enough to often remember it. So I have to work my way through it too. And I want you to feel confident that you should be able to do the same thing. I think for the T distribution and the confidence interval, we made a good discovery with that. And what problem was that one? That was this example, 8.9. So if we go here and make this example 8.9, if you have raw data, you put it into Excel, you highlight the data, you do descriptive st statistics, you put your confidence in, in there, and it gives you the EBM, or the margin of error. So you don't have to do much more than just use this number plus or minus this to get your confidence interval. That makes life much easier. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll talk again soon.